Thank you all for coming today. I appreciate it. Again, just a few housekeeping issues. Uh, the PowerPoint, the post test, and the evaluation will come in a uh, email about an hour after the webinar is over. I'd appreciate it, and Tasa would appreciate it if you can fill it, fill out the post test and the and the evaluation, and send them back. Of course, the PowerPoint's yours to keep. This webinar is being recorded and uh, will be posted on Tasa's YouTube channel in about ten business days. Okay. Um, if you should lose audio today because of whatever the weather is or you're having technical difficulties hearing over the through your computer, the number to call in is at the very top of the chat box. Okay, with that, I'm going to start the webinar. First, I want you to know a little bit about TASA. We are a statewide advocacy organization made up of members, and that includes anybody who wants to join. And what we try to do is to work to address and eliminate uh, sexual violence through public policy and training and prevention and to support programs that serve survivors of sexual assault. <clears throat> we think of ourselves as a unifying voice to eliminate sexual violence in Texas, and we are a coalition of rape crisis centers, advocates, and survivors. And anyone else who wants to join us, and we're committed to fostering a culture that respects the fundal right, fundamental rights and dignities of all Texans. All right, and anyone in the state of Texas. Okay. The other thing I want to say is, I wish I were a brilliant thinker. I am not. I am going to tell you that you can use anything in this presentation, whatever it says, as long as you cite the sources. I'm not the source. I'm just repeating back what I have learned or researched. So please keep that in mind and let's be ethical about that. So what do you think ethics are? Just, you know, you type that in. What do you think ethics are? I don't see anybody answering that, so nobody wants to take a gander at that. All right. How about it's a branch of philosophy that deals with how we ought to live, a standard of behavior. Thank you, Amy, that's exactly right. And because these are philosophical issues, a branch of philosophy, a code of professional conduct, that is also part of it, um, there's no right or wrong answers. And that is very gets very confusing because it creates a lot of gray areas. Um, so, what becomes even more is it's important to be aware of what your ethics are and to be aware of what your organization's ethics are, what their your organization's code of ethics and to follow it. <clears throat> Why do you think it's important to follow a code of ethics, especially an organizational codes of ethics? Whether you're an advocate or a counselor or whatever licensure you have, what makes it important? How about if you do something, quote, unethical, you're opening up the door for all sorts of scrutiny from your funders, from uh, possibilities of lawsuits, of scrutiny, uh, I already said that, agency closure, losing your job, all sorts of stuff. So we need to be very closely aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it and what we believe and we don't. So I have seen it defined this way. Ethics is a system of moral values. <clears throat> it is also ethical integrity is your moral or ethical strength. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, where that comes from. And I like, Amy, your answer about it primarily protects your clients as well as your business. 
<laughs> because that's who are we in the business for to help clients and professional ethics are usually defined as a set of standards and we saw that before based on proven and sound principles of conduct and quality of service that's created from within a profession as a means of what constitutes excellence in the field. Well, <clears throat> ethics, uh, what creates, constitutes ethics in the field, and I would add, according to whom? Uh, ethics in the field within a profession, according to whom? Are all ethics created, are they all equal or not? So <clears throat> these are some of the ethical questions we're going to talk about. Because I think that if we talk about and think about things preactively, we do a much better job of it rather than reactively or thinking about what we're going to do later on. So basically, I would say that <clears throat> before you can make practical what is theoretical, what are the defining ethics and victim services? How many professional codes of ethics are there in this field? And what are your personal ethics? Forget about your professional ethics. What are your, your personal ethics? And this is where areas of controversy arise. So how do we recognize and resolve ethical conflicts, not only within our agencies, with different professions that may exist within our agencies, and with the outside agencies that we collaborate and work with. These are all, you know, these are all factors we have to take into account. But as far as I can tell, all ethics have to do with self-awareness. There are some legal concerns and all sorts of dilemmas that result because of ethical interpretations or different cultures, different values. This is where I'm going to say, and I've heard it said as well, that ethics is not created in isolation. This is why advocates, all advocates need to have in addition, all the different tools and skills in our toolbox that are ethical tools and skills, as well as all the other many, many hats that we wear. This is one that they really, we really have to pay attention to. Okay, because, <clears throat> excuse me, this creates confusion in what we do. It's not one consistent set of standards that all, <clears throat> excuse me, agencies follow. And each has the right to develop those standards that are meaningful for their organization. Does this not create confusion? How am I supposed to know what your standards are? And how are you supposed to know what my standards are? We have some kind of maybe idea of what that is, but not totally. So <clears throat> we've got varying codes of ethics and you can see them right here, you know? And some of the other ethics are based on your professional responsibilities. Who else, when we walk, work with law enforcement, um, <clears throat> we have to remember, uh, and healthcare, HIPAA rules. If we work with law enforcement, what is their first uh, goal? To protect and serve. But Austin um, Police Department, their ethics, their code of ethics is I care and it's integrity and consistency. And I can't remember what the A stands for, but the E at the very bottom action is the A and responsibility and the E is ethics. It's at the very end. Why? because some of their job is to react or act in the moment to protect and serve. So we have to be aware of all the different codes of ethics that are out there and the people that we work with because we have competing interests sometimes and we also have different boundaries and different kinds of um, continuing education that we all need to get but it's different for each profession. So 
I want to ask, can you be an advocate and do therapy with your clients at the same time? In what ways do we or our agencies continue to grow in our professional field and in our expertise? And how does that make that better partners sometimes for some agencies and better partners for people that for agencies with we don't even know we're not even working with right now? So you need to think about that. Who do you think we might partner with in the future? And what does that mean in terms of ethics? Okay. What kind of boundaries is it important to set, not just with clients, but with other professional relationships? Because we can't, sometimes we have those blurry uh, professional relationships as well as friendships. I know that when I was working in a, um, in a shelter and I was on a hotline call, I was a hotline advocate regardless of what else I was hired to do or fell into my wheelhouse. At that time, that was it for me. And I needed to keep those boundaries very clear and in my mind at all times. So I didn't veer off into counseling or I didn't veer off into whatever else I could have veered off into. You know, we're going to look at confidentiality. And what that means within our agency, with our partnering agencies, and outside of our agencies. And how far does confidentiality go? And what is privilege? All right. But three point, I mean, two points that I want us to keep in mind as we move forward. Ethics are fluid, and this drives people crazy, especially me. Note the S at the end of it, ethics. Everybody's ethics are fluid. F and it's fluid. What does that mean? How our work with our agency and other agencies will differ depending on how what's involved, what we're doing, and how it will be different and how it will be the same. It is not my role to go into a forensic exam and tell the forensic uh, person, worker, doctor, nurse, whomever, the medical person, how to do their job. I am not a forensic expert. I know nothing about it. Just as it, it is not the forensic uh, medical person's job to do advocacy work for the survivor. That's just not what it does. So we don't have easy answers. We don't have exact answers. What we need to have is that open communication with the agency and our professional within our agencies and our professional peers so that we figure out in advance where we stand and what we're going to do. Because if we want to collaborate, we need to do so in a sensitive way to the diverse needs and backgrounds, not just of the survivors, but of the agencies we work with. And that's important. And ethical standards can and may be implemented in any number of diverse, innovative ways that are responsive to the needs of various agencies. And what that just means is we can think about it and work it through. And if everybody can sign off on it, you know what? We've got something that works in our little locale that works for us. And what works for me inside of one uh, uh, forensic examination room does not mean that it's going to work that way in another forensic examination room down the, you know, a couple of miles down the road, or that my working with a, um, an advocate from the law enforcement side of it, or the criminal justice side of it, if we figure out one way to work it, doesn't mean that that's going to work that way with every other agency that I work with. So there's benefits to this, uh, that what we can do is establish and recognize and respect ethical standards. The commitment that we have is going to be reflected in our community 
together we can all agree that violence is not a good thing for our communities and what we want in our communities is, is health and safety and freedom to move about. And that is, I think, what we're going to do. And if you have to move to another area to work, at least you're bringing a tool or a skill of what worked successfully somewhere else and bring it up, not as a given, but as an example and what we can do in the here and now. Okay, so why should crisis centers be ethical? What ruins crisis centers, RCCs, any social service agency, more than anything else that I can even think of. And there may be other things, but you know, how, what happens is, in my experience, is that with crisis centers, uh, so social service agencies, one bad experience in a, with a, with a client, with a survivor, and they go back and they talk, and that's it. You've got a lot, a lot of work to do to improve that public relation that's going on with the community. A lot of outreach that needs to be done. A lot of explaining why this happened at this particular point without disclosing who it happened to or breaking confidentiality you have to be aware of what is going on. All right. What complicates matter, again, because this gets very complicated, is that there are community-based organizations and there are systems-based organizations. Systems-based organizations are usually um, governmental agencies, um, for-profit agencies where there's a distance between the executives and the workers. You might have middle managers, but between the workers and the middle managers, there may be supervisors, there may be department heads, there may be all sorts of things. So it's an arrow going up and down. Usually what is learned from the workers doesn't go from very rarely goes from bottom up. It usually the mandates come from top down. All right. As one systems based organization told me, they think all community based um, uh, organizations like nonprofits sit around and sing kumbaya and hold hands and stuff like that. I don't like that, but that is a perception that we need to be aware of. What I would like to say is that we are all chapters in the same novel. We just have different ways of doing what we do. Both types, community-based and systems-based, will provide supportive services, though they might provide them in slightly different ways. Um, we have catchment areas, community-based. You can read for yourself what they are or what they aren't. Um, they have rules and functions, but in a systems base, there is generally no confidentiality or privilege, generally, because governmental employees generally do not qualify for confidentiality or privilege. If they're called to testify, the information that is given is anything and everything they have learned because it is discoverable because of the system they work in. It is a work product. In community-based organizations, most advocates have confidentiality. And in some cases, depending on your certification, you have privilege. And because of the confidentiality involved with advocacy in community-based organizations, documentation really is important. It is really important to put down what is happening versus uh, and being confident and, and, and effective in our documentation. Um, and I'm gonna give examples. There was a woman who was in shelter with her children 
she had had a drug and alcohol problem. She had successfully been clean and sober, even through very, very difficult circumstances. And she, um, her partner was trying to take away her parental rights based on the fact that she had been a drug and alcohol. She had been an addicted, she had been addicted. What the um, person at the age, the shelter wrote down is she came home with the children. They put down their stuff and she took them down the street to the 7-Eleven to get Slurpees. Whoever was working wrote down in the log, so-and-so left to get a drink. That did not fly well in her um, in her her suit to keep her children in the custody battle. It <coughs> it had to be explained, but we can avoid that by thinking about what is going on and how we document and how we're going to write up what we write up and how it helps our clients helps the survivors and not in ways that hinders them okay we have the competence and we have the integrity and you know all this we're trying to practice this it's how we define them that becomes very 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 important so what we have now comes from the National Victim Assistance Standard Consortium. We're going to look at competence, and that is knowing your capabilities and how you can execute them. But it's more than that. It's also understanding your legal responsibilities, your limitations within the delivery setting, duties performed in accordance with the laws and or regulations and or policies policies and or legislative rights of the survivors that we serve and our agency's capacity. If I start giving out legal advice on the hotline or legal advice to the clients that I'm working with, that is not appropriate. What I'm not an attorney, I'm not a legal advocate. Um, what I think I know about the law and what I know about the law are two different things. And we need to be aware that those two things that we do can be at loggerheads. If somebody has a legal question and you are not the legal advocate and your agency doesn't have one, refer them to whoever it is that they need to to get that legal answer, whether it is legal aid or whether it is a civil attorney that works with or for the your organization, figure it out, please. And please do it in a way because advocates are expected to maintain a high standard of professional comp of conduct and a high level of professional competence. And that means you cannot give out information that you don't know or you don't have. The other thing about do no harm is not just the harm that we can do by giving out information that we think we know as opposed to what we do know, but it's also our ability ourselves as advocates, as people who work in the field, to stay healthy, to do no harm to us. So I'm going to beg you to place a high priority on your professional health and well-being, to, to get yourself filled up and to look at and listen to your, um, your professional peers when they go, when they say stuff like, wow, Wendy, you look like you've been a uh, road hard and put up wet. I don't like hearing that. But at the same time, I need to say, what are you seeing? Or when you hear yourself saying, I'm so tired. I can't wait for the weekend to come. All I want to do is sleep in. We need to recognize that as our wellness 
and we should lend support to the well-being of not just ourselves, but our colleagues and our staff as well. All right, integrity. You know what integrity is. I know what integrity is, or I think I know it, but this is how I would define it. Uh, not just according to the, um, not just according to the National Victims Assistance Standards, but survivors assume and our professional peers assume that the information that we provide them is reliable and it is accurate. And that's what I strive for because all I have in this field is my reputation. And if I become known as being less than dependable, then giving information that is less than um, uh, uh, capable or qualified, then nobody's going to come to me anymore to ask me those questions. And TASA as an organization is going to suffer. So I'm going to say advocates should not misrepresent their advocacy, their agency, and their professional responsibilities within the agency. And I know I'm beginning to sound like a broken record, but this is so important. I'm moving on. Our professional responsibilities. We cannot compromise our professional responsibilities or to behave in a manner that might reduce the agency's public trust. When I am out representing TASA, I am not allowed to talk about political issues. I am not allowed to talk about the law unless and only unless it pertains to maybe how we document because I'm not an attorney. Those are my professional responsibilities. I'm not allowed to, when I am out representing TASA, to support any particular cause. I don't even care if the cause is the animal shelter. That is not my job. My job when I am out professionally is to be a trainer and to represent TASA through training. In my personal life, if I decide to go to political rallies or support causes, that's totally fine. I can do it if I choose to. I cannot wear a t-shirt that identifies me with TASA or represents me in any way that would connect me to TASA. Does that make sense? Because I've got to understand those different responsibilities that I have. And I'm not saying we can't have a, um, a personal life. I want us to have a personal life. I want us to stand up for what we believe in and what we advocate for. But on my professional time, on my personal time, I am not working for TASA. And therefore, I do not represent TASA in any way, shape, or form. That's why I don't identify myself as working with TASA. Okay. Respect for people's rights and dignity. This is a given. What happens, though, when somebody does something? You were, we're going to have a little case scenario later on. But what happens when a survivor comes in? We might have worked with them before. We don't like them for whatever reasons. They tick off all our ick, I don't like you boxes. How do we work with them moving forward? And make sure and making sure that we're not discriminating in the delivery of the quality of the service that we're giving them because you know not everybody has the luxury of going oh goodness i've worked with this particular survivor before i can't get along with them therefore um i can't uh, you know i don't know what i can do so i'm going to pass them off to my other colleague here or another victim advocate or another um, counselor and that's not going to work maybe they're you know it just doesn't work this is where you need to know how you can differentiate how you can um, keep yourself way uh, safe and how you can work with a um, uh, and I'll try to use me as an example um, when I was doing um, clinical rotations and then later on when I worked, 
um, I have a very definite bias about um, a certain um, oh, personality disorder. And um, I would beg the, cl the clinical supervisor not to give me anybody who was a borderline personality. I, I couldn't work with them for whatever the reasons. They drive me crazy. I understand my biases. And I was having a really hard time separating, um, separating myself from that bias to provide a service. Um, unfortunately, I was not always able to not have borderline personalities on my caseload. And I found myself, and I understood this, and my clinical, clinical supervisor understood this, debriefing and working with and going in before each session because I needed it. And that's how I could deliver a service that was of quality to the, um, the, the survivor and could not be judged as discriminatory at all. I was very hyper aware of it. And I, believe me, to this day, I still have problems with that. And I don't do that kind of service anymore. So I don't practice that way. But we have to be aware of where we stand. Otherwise, we're going to shortchange our clients. And I do not believe that that is our intention. OK. Uh, concerns. Passionate. We talked about this when a conflict. I think I skipped one. OK. Where's our social responsibilities? OK. Okay, integrity, confidence, professional, respect for people's rights, concern, we need to be concerned for their welfare, not just our survivors, but also our partnering agencies. We need to be concerned about that. We need to be concerned about how when conflicts arise, we're going to fulfill our duties in a manner that doesn't cause harm to anyone involved, or we're going to try to do it that way. So what that means is we're going to have some social responsibilities that we're going to need to educate ourselves on legally and community wise. And that means that anybody ever been called out for a hospital call and you get there and the argument is between, I don't want to say argument, but the conflict is between a certain cultural group that exists in the community wanting to do some kind of cultural healing healing ceremony and the hospital or or wherever the exam is being done will not allow that into the examination room you have to think about that you know you have to think about how can we make this so so that the survivor gets the kind of care that they need because if they've called out someone in their community to help them heal that is very important to them so we have to understand that. And we have to understand that we want to be able to reduce crime and victimization. We don't want to re-victimize a person. We don't want to re-victimize a survivor. So how do we understand who's, you know, the, the old Mr. Rogers? Who are the people in your neighborhood? And how do you make them feel welcome, regardless of where they are in the process? And how do we make that so, so that they understand that we have been thinking about them even though they never thought about us okay so this calls for a lot of ethical decision making it means we have to have some effective approaches in terms of reframing what we're seeing brainstorming with our our collaborators our professional peers in order to make something work these, you know, not just the assessments of the fact, but some of the ineffective approaches to making decisions can be mental because we have some mental attitudes about what should or shouldn't be, or we rationalize what is or isn't happening, or we go passive and we don't contribute to the solution, even though we don't like it. 
we get dogmatic and say it's my way or the highway and that's not going to work either you know we get rigid in our thinking well the rules say this well yeah well how can we make this happen outside of what and where we need to be if the forensic exam room and i keep going back to that but if that is supposed to be a sterile environment and somebody wants to have some kind of cultural uh ritual healing performed can it be done outside the emergency room doors can is there another room where sage can be burned these are the things we need to think about proactively rather than reactively and getting it's not not in my territory uh -uh, that's not going to happen like having an argument with the um, detective involved or the investigators involved because they believe one thing and you believe another and heaven forbid we should do that arguing in front of the survivor these are not good things and we can create false dilemmas oh my god and overreact and we go oh my god this is so unfair this is not good and we end up saying it in front of the uh survivor and that i mean ooh, you know that agency is so uncooperative we don't need that. They're going to have to work with that agency and they're going to have to work with us too. And they don't need to be carrying tales forward. They don't need to be re-traumatized. They don't need to hear any of this. So thinking it through becomes a huge deal. Okay. We have to have some orientation when we deliver our services because this is how we establish rapport between not just providers and survivors, but with other agencies. Again, we need to understand different codes of ethics, our own, where the interactions are, where they aren't, and how we need to do that, all right? That means that there are values that are formed here and developed as a result of growing up, which means how were we raised as children? What do we think is effective? Or what did we learn as children? Uh, religion in terms of how it influenced what we learned in the family and what it taught and reinforced the values of what we learned. Um, what about the social organizations that we choose to belong to? Because again, that teaches values and reinforces values like the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, Boys and Girl Club. Um, if you are on a basketball team or a sports team, they all reinforce, they all have values and they reinforce. And we have that that may be our goals they may be something that i hold sacred to me but that doesn't mean that that is something that my professional peers or even my co-workers hold it doesn't mean anything we have to be aware of that because if we're not we're gonna we're gonna offend someone whether whoever it is we're going to offend them and we can't afford to do that so we need to be open and to say you know use those great i statements i feel i value and i'm willing to listen to anybody else's ideals and values and customs and modes and trying to figure out how we can problem solve in order to make the survivor move forward and it may be that this survivor has a particular need that nobody has ever addressed before and you may never address again but you know what when you move forward in that process when you start moving forward with that you're creating building blocks or cornerstones and trust you're establishing something that looks great for the whole community okay um and that's, I think I need to be quiet because when we look at and understand our own values, we're looking at cultural values that we hold. What we're doing is that um, if we think that we are superior to others because of what we hold, I think that causes problems and we may need to rethink how we do our jobs and how we interact with each other. This is really 
hard work because there's two different definitions of ethics here. You know, the study of philosophical, and then there's the morality and the philosophical reflection. Basically, the questions are, what should I do in this situation? And each situation is different. And because they're different yet similar, and if you want to get down to it, the study of ethics is looking at the behaviors and practices and conducts and responding to situations. It's looking at a right way and a wrong way. And I want to challenge that because that's black and white thinking. It's individual situations and understanding that when I'm working with someone, whether they're my professional peer or they're a survivor, they may very well have come from places that I don't understand because I have not walked in their shoes and that all forms of desperation don't look alike. And because maybe I have never made or had to make a decision under those forms of uh, under that kind of desperation. And I need to listen to and, uh, and make the make the judgment that people are doing the best they can with what they have and to talk about what that is and to talk about what I am seeing and feeling in just that I statements so that we can come to something and move forward with something that is ethical and um, for those of us, who, for those who are interested in ethical focused uh, or ethical solutions, you know, uh, practices, uh, solution focused stuff. I sorry, I stumbled over my words there. Um, the ethics of solution focused. What is it? And that might be a great topic for somebody to make a presentation on. And I would love to listen to it. Um, just putting a hook out there. So I want you to think about Julia and Charlotte as we move forward and we talk about the standards that are there. All right, Julia is an advocate with the law enforcement agency and she's working, she has worked with Charlotte in the past. This is not the first time she has taken Charlotte to the emergency room for uh, family violence and for sexual assaults within family violence. <clears throat> and Charlotte mm -hmm. tends to recant her stories. In fact, in the last year, she recanted one really violent assault as the case started to move through the legal system. Julia is now trying to complete a compensation form to help Charlotte with her medical expenses. <clears throat> okay, I want you to think about this because this is not the first time this has happened. I'm going to throw in another vignette in here, another story. You are a victim advocate, doesn't matter where in the system you are, in a very small county, and you cover a bunch of territory in the county, and you are called to the hospital because there is a victim there, that's all you know at the time, who has been beat up by severely by their partner. And you arrive on the scene at, in the emergency room and you have figured, you walk in and you see A, number one, that the victim is your uncle and B, number two, that the partner is a male. And you had no idea that your uncle was gay and you have certain uh, beliefs and philosophies about same-sex partnerships. What do you do as you move forward? So I want you to keep this in mind as we're going to look at ethical standards for advocates. You've got to know, if you're working in this field, you pretty much have to know what your liabilities are. You have to know all the statutes that govern all aspects of victim services. That is daunting. And I'm going to tell you that I don't know it. And I've been in this field a long time. What I think is really important is to understand what you provide 
your responsibilities within those that this ethical standards, what statutes govern your stuff, and to have a good acquaintance of knowing what the standards are with the other agencies you are involved with. And if you don't know, you need to ask the person what they are working with, the other profession, your professional peer. So it says you must know all the statues, okay, because basically we can all agree harm has been done and we are not here to do more harm. Okay, we've got to actively represent our professional titles and qualifications and our credentials. And I think we, I'll try to do that as best we can. I want to tack on something here as well. When we're working and we walk in and we meet the, the survivor for the first time, it may be helpful to say something like, especially if we're meeting them in, 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 in a crisis, wherever they may be, and saying, hi, my name is Wendy Hilsonrod. Um, I go by she, her, hers and I am an advocate with the crisis center. I don't represent, and you know the speech from there on in. If the person doesn't hear or doesn't understand her, hers, her, um, doesn't matter, flew over their head, that's fine. But if the person, what are we telling? What are we telling the survivor in that moment when you give your personal pronouns? I want you to think about that one for a moment. Well, we just tell them. We are affirming, and it could also mean not just that we are affirming, we are safe people. Exactly. We're not binary. We understand that between what I and there's multiple ways of looking at stuff. And that's really, really important. And I think that should bear some part of our ethics, especially when we're meeting survivors for the first time. Okay, because it's not just the, the, the survivors who assume that the information we are giving them is accurate. It is our professional peers. And I've talked about that for a bit. Okay. Victim assistance providers must maintain a high standard of professional contact. What does that mean? It means proper, we have to avoid improper behavior. If you are on call and you decide to have wine with dinner and you get a call three hours later and you only had one glass of wine and you're going in and this is a drug facilitated sexual assault, or the, uh, the perpetrator has been drinking and the survivor even gets a little whiff of alcohol on your breath, oh boy, they're not going to want you around. So please be careful. When you are on call, you are working. You're not, you know, you are just working. All right. So we've got to be careful with that. <laughs> and we also have to be careful that just because when I worked with the, uh, when I was embedded in the uh, law enforcement, whenever I moved to a new neighborhood, um, they would, I would get advice telling me, no, you don't want to go to that neighborhood. It's too risky. And I'm like, you can't do that to me. You can't run this. You can't do that. Uh, I understand law enforcement has different operates under different confidentialities and standards. They thought we, they were doing me a favor. I sincerely appreciated it, but that's not something they would do for just anyone who walked into the law enforcement agency. And so I, I had to ask them that it violated my code of ethics, my agency standard, and we needed to be careful about that. All right. High level of professional competence. That is why y'all are attending this, you know, um, because we are, to, if we're to do the best needs of the victim, we need to stay current on what is going on, not just in our field, 
who is in our community? Who can we refer to? What are they doing? What kind of trainings are they having? Can they, uh, are they allowed, can they join our trainings? Can we join theirs? So that we can get all the information and store it away somewhere. And if nothing else, if it doesn't pertain to us, at least to uh, get that contacts and referrals and to have a network that we're going to create instead of us being so isolated. Okay, professional ways to promote mutual respect. I'm going to tell you what, it's really important to be a face of what we are going on. I love it when I get a call from some agency that says, we would love to have you sit on a panel. I love it when I can make a call and say to another agency, we would love it if we could sit on a panel. You know, um, we talk about strange bedfellows and sometimes we talk about it with politics but has anybody ever thought about including the social workers at all the schools you know in the public education system starting with early head start and moving all the way up to graduate school and beyond um do we talk about bringing some nurse or social worker at a pediatric clinic in? So we need to start coordinating with the communities because our goal is to keep our communities safe and healthy. All right, must share their knowledge with their colleagues and to encourage professional competence and this is what I'm trying to do. And this is why I ask you all, if you've got some specific knowledge that you want to share and you want to put it out there, send me an email. Let's get a webinar up. I will help you. I will co-facilitate it with you if that's what you want or help you co-facilitate it with others in your field because that is so, so important. We need to know what's going on. I, in my job at TASA, depend on other experts in the field to provide us with their cutting edge trainings. Okay. Um, we have to contribute to the interests of systems that impact the victims of crime. If we see a gap, we need to talk about that gap and we need to understand what is going on. It breaks my heart when people say to me, who do you work for? And I say, I work for TASA, and they go, never heard of that. And that's in a professional setting. That really, really upsets me. Your community needs to know who you are, what you do, what your services are, so that even if they're calling you, and it's not the service they need, at least they understood that they were open and that they could, they felt welcomed to call you for what they needed. Okay. We're going to talk about direct services. Uh, we need to protect and, you know, respect and attempt to protect civil, the civil rights. That's why we do this. For me, this is a call to do civil rights stuff. It is important for people to have their dignity. You know, a survivor's desires and wants may contra uh, contradict the opinions that I, I have. I may offer, uh, many years ago, I was traveling cross country and I love to listen, especially to AM radio as I'm traveling cross country. And in my daily life, especially back then, I was really, really busy. And I didn't listen to uh, radio except to listen to music. And I didn't listen to talk radio because I didn't have the time to give it the attention I wanted to. And so I decided I was going to listen to Dr. Dr. Laura came on and I decided I was going to listen to it. And I almost crashed my car. Um, I had to pull off the highway. I got so mad. It was a social worker who was working with youth who had called in. She had a very strong belief that abortions were not, it was against everything she believed in. 
She worked, she was working with a teenage girl. She was 16 and she did not want to give her the information about abortions that were legal in her state and the clinics and what to expect and to just even provide the information. And Dr. Laura said, good for you, stand up for your values, stand up for this. And I will say good for her for standing up, but how can you provide information without passing judgment to a client if you cannot give them the information? And if you are so upset about that, then why are you working with that particular population, you know? Um, don't go there. Don't work at, at agencies that, that offer that kind of information because they, you have to give the most pertinent information and you, you don't have to agree with the survivor's um, decision. What we have to know is, yes, we provided the information and ask them pertinent questions about how do you think you're going to feel about that down the line? Other than that, it's not our business. It is their, it is the client's business to make their own decisions. That's called empowerment. And that's what we're there for. Okay. <clears throat> the communicate, we have to be very, 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 very careful about microaggressions, about oppression in, in all the four forms of it, all the four legs of it, and uh, the microaggressions that come from that. I was very tempted to put slides in here on that and decided against it because that's a whole nother training, but we need to be very careful that we are always affirming, that we are always about uh, empowering our, our survivors and that they know that we are safe people because they're going to hear so many bad things, especially in the criminal justice system about why this, why that. We don't need to do that with them. You know, we just don't need to do that at all. Okay. So we've got to preserve confidentiality. What are the exceptions? And how long does that confidentiality last? I'm asking y'all if you can chat that in. Harm to self or others. What's the other one? Ongoing crime. Okay, there's one more. Harmful act to child, suicidality, commitment of a crime. You got it. That is a mandated reporting. When do you tell that to the to your clients or the survivors? Abuse of elder child, absolutely right. When do you tell that to them? Right up front, right up front. What does that mean um, initially? Or what does initially mean? Okay, is there a difference in mandated reporting if someone comes in and discloses for the first time that grandpa abused them and grandpa's been dead for 10 years? and coming in and saying grandpa abused them and grandpa is still living and your cousins who some of them are much younger are going over and spending the night at grandpa's house. Everybody has a way of informing and I don't think there's a right or a wrong way here. I generally told when I was doing counseling work I started every session with, I'm a mandated reporter. And when they started to go down some, tell me something, then I would say stuff like, um, I'm sensing that you're, going to, that you're going to tell me something that I might need to report. And just leave it at that and let the survivor decide what they do or don't want to say. In the case of grandpa being dead, I would still make the report and I would have the survivor sit with me and we would make the report together. If the it was ongoing, grandpa still alive, that was reported immediately, whether the, the survivor wanted to report it or not, I was now mandated to report it. Okay. 
And we've got to have what goes along with this mandated reporting is consent forms signed initially, first meeting, because that is that tells them this is what you're going to do. Okay. And when a medical emergency arises, again, you probably have some kind of medical intake form. When a medical emer emergency arises, something in your in the shelter, at, in the housing, in your office, there should be a consent form signed so that if something happens medically, you can turn it over to the first responders. Okay. <clears throat> All righty. Confidentiality. Primary obligation, we said that some people said this at first, the primary obligation is to protect our survivors' privacy. It goes along with informed uh, you know, consent and all these other stuff. However, different people have different ideas about what informed consent or clear and imminent danger means. To whom? We need to know. So when do you tell the client by law what you have to report? And as you said, during the first meeting, when you're getting informed consent, I used to do it at the start of each session. That's it. Um, but what happens when someone, you know, in one of the shelters I worked with, if a mom had to leave for work or whatever, and another uh client at the shelter another survivor decided that they could that they were going to watch them there had to be a, a signed consent form between the two and turned into staff this is an actual case <clears throat> one survivor was watching a, a client another survivor's child the child was four years old this child had speech and cognitive impairments the child went to went to the bathroom uh, with the help of the person who was watching them, and that person noticed that there were blood spots on the the, the underwear. She asked very clearly of the four year old what happened, and um, she's getting triggered. And the four-year-old, this is what the survivor told me, the babysitting survivor said, she told her that her mama had bit her down there and she was totally freaked out. And she comes running in and I'm going, okay, this needs to be reported, but we need to wait till mama comes home. When mama came home, what had happened was very different than what was actually the babysitting survivor understood so we need to understand where the information is coming from the child went in daycare she was dressed in a she was wearing a dress she got chigger bites on the outside of her of her pubic area and she was scratching them the client had already taken her to the doctor and had already uh, put the salve on. Might that have been useful information for babysitting survivor to know? Absolutely. But was this a mandated reporting? No, it was not. Okay. All right. So in Texas, who has confidentiality and who has privilege? All right. Usually people who have privilege in Texas, attorneys have privilege, um, religious uh, folk who listen to confession or give counseling have privilege, doctors have privilege, medical personnel usually have privilege, PhDs generally have privilege, and sometimes uh, therapists who work with licensed professionals at uh, RCCs um, or uh, uh, dual shelters or shelters have privilege sometimes, but confidential and privilege get confused a lot. 
A confidential information is one that is intended not to be disclosed, but if subpoenaed in court, it can be disclosed. All right. Remember, I talked about the count, the advocate who wrote went to get drinks out there. It was disclosed in court because it was a confidential communication. It wasn't a privileged communication. All right. A privileged communication is not one that can be disclosed. I'm going to say a little bit more about that. This is Texas. If your files get subpoenaed, what is your agency's policy? How do you ethically follow that? And you need to know this. You need to know what you so you know how to do your writing and your, your you know what you write in your, your what you're writing up, your notes, your case notes. Okay, I worked for one agency that kept two sets of books, one about what actually happened and one that had redacted information in it. Whether what you feel about that or not is your stuff. Uh, I understand that didn't set too well with me. I worked for another agency that said it subpoenaed everything goes and that also didn't set too well with me. And another agency I worked for said, um, we're going to take, we're going to call up the judge's clerk. We're going to ask for a meeting with your honor in chambers. We're going to show them everything that we have. And we're going to ask your honor to decide, does this all need to be in court? Is it all relative? Because we do not want to disrespect the subpoena. There may be other stuff, other ways to deal with it. I'm just putting it out there so that you all can talk about it, think about it. What do you want to do? Because confidentiality is huge. That is the way that the community and the survivors trust us. And if we can't keep it, we need to let them know why. And we need to let them know up front that if something is subpoenaed, this is what our agency does. Okay, confidentiality. And there it is. This is Texas. Okay, direct services. <clears throat> We've got to avoid conflict of interest. I don't know how to say that any plainer, any clearer, any differently. Uh, <clears throat> as in my professional role, I can also not be, uh, like we said, representing one thing and another. I cannot go out and do political work on Tasa's time. That's not going to. That's 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 a conflict of interest. Tasa's interest is to support everyone in Texas who works with survivors, for survivors, and survivors themselves. That's our mission, and that's it. So we have to keep that perspective. I have to keep that perspective in mind. I cannot accept gifts. That would be a conflict of interest, you know? But there are certain things that we can or can we accept all right what's the difference of conflict of interest if someone says to me oh you're just nice to so and so th this survivor because they bake you cookies all the time see where it can lead to so what happens if a survivor bakes you cookies what do we tell them up front about accepting gifts and if they still bring us cookies do we put it out in the waiting room so everybody can enjoy them? Got to be proactive in what we think about and what we do. Okay. All right. You know, when do we terminate a relationship with a survivor? How do we know it's time to terminate this relationship? What does failure to thrive mean in your agency? How do you know they're not going to benefit from continued services? 
What if somebody appears to be yay, hey, hooray, a survivor is moving on, they're empowered, they feel they don't need that anymore. And we let them go from service, we release them with our blessings, and then they call three weeks later because they're triggered and they're in a bad place again. Or what happens when somebody doesn't appear to be moving forward as quickly as we would like because we've got these grant deliverables that we have to have and they're moving a millimeter every three months as opposed to moving a millimeter every three days. How does that apply to our ethics? What do we do? And if we're going to terminate the relationship with the survivor, where's the warm handoff? What comes next for them? For somebody who can do more or can work with them better or longer, okay? Um, because if a survivor should, should tell me, I need to learn how to cook, I'm not the person to give them that kind of guidance. Um, or if they ask for financial, how to make a budget, I'm not that person. So to know who is and how you can hand that off. All right. Personal relationships. Is it ever appropriate to engage in personal relationships with our survivors? Thank you. I say no, it never is. And what would the reason for that be? I would say that the reason for that is if I know about you, and it says it right here, it's power and control over. If somebody, if I'm having a personal relationship with a survivor, how empowered are they to call me on my BS should they see it? Would they not be giving some power and control to me? And that's my concern. You know, um, if you work in a small community or you have a small community that you work with, um, I uh, it becomes it can become uncomfortable because those dual relationships can be difficult to avoid. Um, I worked um, I worked in a small community at one point in time. My kids were in school and I go to the PTA meeting and who am I walking into? Other parents that I have worked with. Uh, I say that I want to sit on a committee for the PTA to raise money or whatever. And who else is there? Other, you know, other past clients. I have to be very clear about we can't talk. I cannot acknowledge you. We're here to do a fundraising thing. You cannot talk to me about what is going on in your life. And I'm not going to ask you the questions, not because I don't care, not because I don't want to know, but because it's unethical. And that is something we need to tell our clients, not in the moment, in reactively, but proactively as well. Okay. <clears throat> we can't discriminate based on anything our grants don't allow for that we shouldn't allow for that and if we do discriminate you know um we need to understand why um i am if i'm going to sit in the, in an office i was once in the position where the survivor told the abuser who i was where i was located and what my phone number was and um the perp called me up and made all sorts of threats and spoke increasingly ugly to me and um i had to report that to law enforcement because i was becoming pretty concerned about not just my safety but the safety of my family and i didn't want to i didn't want to stop working with the survivor and yet the thought crossed my mind and I didn't want the survivor to stop working with any kind of professional whose help they deemed they needed just because of the perp. That's about power and control. So we need to be really, really careful. 
about what we do and how we're doing it. Opportunities for colleagues, uh, <clears throat> our victim assist to seek appropriate services for themselves when traumatized by a criminal event or a client interaction. I had to sit down that what I just told you, I had to sit down with my, my clinical supervisor and say, this is what's happening. And I know it's starting to color the way I think about this particular survivor. And it's also becoming an issue for me in thinking about my safety and the safety of my family and the safety of the community. And what can we do about not the, not the survivor, but the perp. And to have my colleagues say to me, Wendy, we're concerned for you. He's a badass, excuse my language. He's not a nice person. Um, so we need to have, be able to offer feedback. We need to be able to uh, have some look at each other through tra uh, trauma-informed lenses and then to have places where we can process and to have mental health in our jobs, whether it's a mental health break or a mental health, you know, a, a mental health break room or a mental health day that we take because the jobs that we do are valuable and they're difficult. They're very difficult. The other part of ethics, and it's not where I shine, is to be able to do administrative and evaluate evaluation work. So we need to be able to report the conduct of our colleagues, what we're seeing, we're able to quantify it or to other professionals. It's not okay if we think that someone is having a problem with or an addiction problem that we need to be able to understand what our ethical standards are and what's being violated. It's not okay if I walk into my colleague's office and they pull out a bottle of gin and go, come on, we're on our lunch hour, nobody really cares. That's problematic and it needs to be reported. And it may be a written report and it may be, we need to talk about this because this is what I'm going to do. All right. So we're going to talk about dual relationships, which we did, it's not okay to have. The, We've got to remember all of these things, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> for professional behaviors. What is the voice of justice versus the voice of caring? For me, the voice of justice <clears throat> comes down more in this will not happen and is seen almost in the way of power over where the voice of caring is, I'm concerned for you if you proceed this way, because <clears throat> I see this, what is it you're expecting? What does justice mean to you? And what is it that you want? <clears throat> Excuse me. We might have competing priorities um, with the survivor and with other agencies, which can be personal and professional or conflicts of interest, or in some cases, not understanding where the survivor is coming from based on their cultural, that culture or cultural um, viewpoints. And that is cultural humility. That means we need to understand where they're coming from, why they're coming from, and asking those questions beforehand. We have to know boundaries 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 not just where we begin and end with clients but also where we begin and end and stay in our professional lanes it is inappropriate for me to tell the investigators how to investigate and it is inappropriate for the investigators to tell the da's office how they need to pr uh, prosecute the case and it's inappropriate for the da to tell the forensic examiners how they are supposed to do the forensic exam and it's not okay for the forensic examiners to tell advocates how to do their jobs. 
So we need to stay in our lanes. We need to know where we're supposed to begin and end, where we share, what confidentialities we have signed or MOU signed, um, where we, we cannot be enmeshed, but we need to be empowering of each other and how our own personal history is going to affect not only our ability to work with survivors, but to work with other professions. There have been times that, I, you know, I've been in this field for a long time, and a lot of the people that I started out with now have other jobs in other agencies, and some of them I like tremendously, and some of them I've never really cared for. We have had a history. Does that mean that we can't work together? That is where that dual relationship needs to begin and end. I don't have to be your friend. You don't have to be my friend. We need to be professional peers. And that's what we need to do with the help in the, we need to do with our professional peers and how we help them work. So ethically, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions that I think merit some kind of self-reflection. And you don't have to answer them, but you can take them with you as you move forward and going, how do you recognize suicidality or suicide ideation? And if you're not the person with the uh, letters behind your name at your agency, how do you refer? How do you make that warm handoff? What do you do if this is a hotline call? How do we move forward with that? You know, what constitutes excellence, excellence in service delivery? And in particular, in your particular role. And if you see someone who isn't delivering what you think is excellence in service delivery for our survivors, what is the process then of calling it to somebody's attention and to making it work better? What does it mean to be well-trained and well-informed? Because there's a big difference between experience and book learning. And how is accountability formalized? I would want to know that. And how can accountability for survivors through a victim-focused lens or a trauma-focused lens be built into the criminal justice system? Or can it? Because that's also part of an ethical responsibility. Does your agency have a code of ethics? If not, what code of ethics does your agency use? Do you agree with your agency's code of ethics? What does informed consent mean and how is it used at your agency? Does your agency have a grievance policy, not just for staff, but for survivors as well? How does the agency protect personally identifiable information? Where do you put your case notes at night? Is it locked up? What does ethics have to do with charting and what's appropriate to write in the charts? And do you know clearly what to do when charts are subpoenaed? And can you articulate that to clients? Okay. How do you know you were not doing any harm to your survivor? How do you know that? Are they going to tell you or are they just not going to come back? How do you know when your technique is working, which goes along with not doing any harm? Um, I worked with a client once who had cognitive impairments, didn't look like she did, but had cognitive impairments. And she had children and she was in, uh, CPS was breathing down her neck, telling her that she was not going to be able to keep these children due to neglect. She didn't know what they were talking about. And they were telling her they have, that her children need to be bathed, washed, fed, and put to bed on a consistent basis. Um, the woman couldn't tell time. The way that the advocates got her on track was that when Oprah came on, she did this. And when, because she always had the TV on in her house. And when Jerry Springer came on, it meant this. And when the nightly news came on, it meant that. And that is a way or a technique that was working. Just telling her at 8 a.m. the children or 8 p.m. the children need to go to bed. You know, how do you recognize denial? Client's denial? 
denial of other our professional peers and yours and your agencies. You know, we need to do this. We need to understand it. How do we know if the client is reporting everything to us? We won't know, but this involves trust building and this involves establishing rapport. And that takes time. I'm, you know, most survivors that I've worked with never scratched their head at night and said, you know, I heard Wendy's an excellent advocate and I want to work with her. So how do I get there? You know, what's going on? If you've got to terminate a, a, a survivor, do you check on them? What other impairments might a, a survivor and or an advocate have that might be problematic? Not to just what they do, but to the community. And I mean, the agency and our peer professionals and the community as a whole. We need to think about that. Um, you know, what kind of boundaries is it important to, to, and we've talked about and confidentiality. And when is communication covered or not covered? You know, what about excited utterances? What about things that are said on the way to the hospital, either in a police vehicle, law enforcement vehicle, or inside of the ambulance itself? Is confidentiality covered then? Basically, it's not. Okay. So I want to, we've talked about this a little bit before, but this is more than standards of practices. This is about actions that we do every day in our, in our community. It's about good communication. It's about making consistent decisions always. It's about helpful and avoiding standards help us to avoid dual roles. It's about respect. And more important than that, it is exhausting because it's a never ending process. Always, always, always. Here are my resources that I used. Um, here's how I can be reached. Are there any questions, any suggestions, anything you want to add right now? I'm going to put up the postcast, but please be aware that it's going to come to you. Um, in an email that you are going to receive um, within about an hour or so after I end this and um, along with your certificate of attendance and the PowerPoint. You all are most welcome. And like I said, I am happy and here to do anything and everything I can to help you go down this road of advocacy that we have all chosen. Thank you all so much.